Hello, book people! October's almost done, but I realized I never filmed the wrap-up video for September. Makes sense. I was sick. I'm not even sure I could have sat down and talked about all the books that I read because I was sick as a dog in September. I could not have sat down for over an hour and filmed this, but I can't forget September because it was my most successful month of the year. 20 books read. Some of them, a lot of them were really short, but 20 books nonetheless. I read eight novels, two novellas, two graphic novels, one work of nonfiction, and seven short stories. So let's talk about it. Starting off with a book from an author that is quickly becoming one of my favorites, Cold Moon Over Babylon by Michael McDowell was a southern gothic masterpiece. It was not as good as Blackwater. Very few books I will ever read for the rest of my life will be as good as Blackwater by Michael McDowell. But Cold Moon Over Babylon was a creepy ghost story that follows this family that is being haunted and hit by tragedy after tragedy, and we're trying to figure out who this killer is, we're trying to figure out why bad things keep happening to this family, there's ghosts, there's racism, it takes place in a southern small town, I love the character work, I love the dialogue, Big Bad was completely despicable, I loved the ending, it was so cathartic, beautifully written, Michael McDull, he really can write, and also, on a little side tangent, one common character archetype that is prevalent in Michael McDowell's works that I'm noticing is there's always a sassy, beautiful, heavy set southern lady that everybody loves, and I loved that character in this book. I rated it 4.25 out of 5 stars. It was an amazing book, he pulled it off masterfully, but I've seen this type of story done many times before, and I know this book is old, I know this book is dated, but I feel like it could have been even better, it could have been more original. And this is just because I'm a modern reader reading an older book. But yeah, really dang good book. But there's not going to be too much that surprises you. He was 42 years old. And he could see nothing before him that he wished to enjoy and little behind him that he cared to remember. The next book I read was a book that's very popular on Book Talk, Very popular on BookTube. And after reading it, I can see why. Stoner by John Williams was an absolute masterpiece. We follow William Stoner, a lowly college English professor, and we follow his unremarkable life. This book was very interesting because it starts off at William Stoner's funeral, and it talks about how, like, no one held him in high regard. No one thought very much of him. He had very few friends. He had very few enemies. His life seems to be like a complete failure. So I was expecting to read a story about a person who was completely unremarkable and how his life was meaningless. And what I got instead was an incredibly moving, emotional story about a man who lived his life, a life filled with tragedies, a life filled with successes, and it was just so relatable, so raw. John Williams really captured a lot of the insecurities that I feel like I have about growing up, about leaving my mark, about living my life, and he put it in this small book. And I love William Stoner as a character. He was not a remarkable individual. But after reading this book, it really reminded me of like the quote I heard when I was younger. The most remarkable thing is an unremarkable person. Or the most special thing is, a, is an unspecial person. I'm not sure what quote it is. But you know what quote I'm talking about. William Stoner, his life did not go according to plan. His life was nothing the bards will sing of. But his lo the loss of this life, the loss of this story... The loss of this individual is something to mourn. So even if you're somebody who's not particularly special, your life still has value. And I really feel like John Williams perfectly captured all that sense of angst, all that sense of ex existential dread in this book. This, is, this was a 5 out of 5 stars for me. Absolute masterpiece. I see why it's held in such high regard. I will definitely have to be giving the last novel of John Williams to try before the end of the year because I've loved the two books I've read from him. Butcher's Crossing was good even though it wasn't my cup of tea, but Stoner, amazing, the perfect read for me at this time in my life. What is magic but a science not yet discovered? Perhaps the biggest development for me as a reader, the biggest thing to happen for me in September for this booktube channel is I finally read my first Brandon Sanderson book. And I really enjoyed it. Brandon Sanderson is a titan 
in the fantasy genre. He has several ongoing series. He writes several books a year. He finished The Wheel of Time. He writes science fiction. He writes fantasy. And he's just one of the most successful authors, period. Perhaps he'll end up being the GOAT by the time he is done. But I didn't know where to go with his bibliography. He has so many books. His Cosmere Multiverse is monu monumentally humongous. I did not know where to dive into this massive bibliography. So I decided on picking up one of his standalone books, and I picked up The Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. And this book was silly, and I loved it. The premise of this book is silly and interesting and engaging. Our protagonist wakes up in medieval England, and he's not sure how he got there. He's not sure why he went to England. He's not sure who he was. All he knows is that somebody is chasing after him, that he is from the future. He has this handbook with him, but all the pages are missing, so he has no idea like the context of why he is on this adventure. All the locals think that he is a wizard because he has scientific implants and upgrades that make him seem like a magical being. And he goes on this, this adventure to discover who, who he is. And perhaps he won't like what he finds out about himself. I love this character. I loved his character development. I love all the supporting cast of characters. I found the plot to be very engaging. Brandon Sanderson's prose leaves a lot to be desired. But this is a meat and potato story told in a masterful way perfect pacing. I love the payoff at the end. I love the emotional highs and lows. I love the climax. I love the way I love the way the confrontation of the big bad goes towards the end. Brandon Sanderson, perhaps he's not the best writer. I have a very limited, you know, like a very limited like pool of things I've read from him. I've only read one book, but if he could write like this consistently, Five, four out of five times, he might end up becoming my favorite author. But we'll, ha we'll just have to wait and see. The way sadness works is one of the strange riddles of the world. If you are stricken with a great sadness, you may feel as if you have been set aflame, not only because of the enormous pain, but also because your sadness may spread over your life. Like smoke from an enormous fire, you might find it difficult to see anything but your own sadness. The way smoke can cover a landscape so that all anyone can see is black. You may find that if someone pours water over you, you are damp and distracted, but not cured of your sadness. The way a fire department can douse a fire, but never recover what has been burnt down. I'm 29 years old, and so part of getting ready to turn 30 is that you try to do things like recapture your youth. I always wanted to read a series of unfortunate events by Lemony Stickett because when I was younger, when this children's book series was in its heyday, I was not a very strong reader. So I did not read these books. So I picked up the first installment, The Bad Beginning, and does this story hold up? I think it does. I love the dark humor in this book. I love Lemony Stickett's writing style. I will definitely be making my children read these books, and I will read along with them because... This is really cute. It follows the Baudelaire orphans. Well, maybe it's not cute. It's cute in a tragic sort of way. It follows some orphans who are very rich and wealthy. Their parents pass away in a great fire. And they are adopted by this Count Olaf, who's this evil individual. And they're trying to figure out his dastardly scheme. And they're trying to escape from Count Olaf. And this series, I think, is 12 or 13 books long. And Count Olaf is the primary antagonist. I love the dark humor. I love the way Lemony Stickett is able to describe very complex emotions. I do feel like even younger children, preteen age children, can understand this book and get a lot from it. But as an adult, it's still pretty dang good. I read books that are worse than it this month. We are an angel of the Lord, and we will not be denied our vengeance. One of my goals for 2024 was to finish some of the series I was already reading at the start of this year. And I finally finished a series. I read The Ghoul King by Guy Haley. And though I did finish this series, and though this installment was better than the previous installment, the first installment in this series, The Emperor's Railroad, I learned that the author has no plans on finishing this series. So I'm left on a cliffhanger, and I'll never get the answers I'm looking for. I'll never see how the story ends. I'll never get the sense of catharsis that I am looking for. So even though 
the Ghoul King was 3.5 out of 5 stars for me. I'm pissed off because I will not get the closure I, I want. And it makes sense because... Guy Haley is known for his Warhammer novels, and those are much more successful than this series, and I think this series did not sell very well, but that's still a damn shame. I wouldn't have continued on with this series if I would have known it would have never been finished, because the first book can really be read as a standalone. So that's lame, but one more series out of the way, which left me open to pick up some new series, which just made me take like one step forward, two steps back. That's a big old nope sandwich with the side of Hell Noslaw. I'd heard enough. I did my part. And if there was a magical flying intangible forest baby somewhere out there, I'd leave it to the professionals to figure out where it went. Moon woke me up nine times. Still just 4 a.m. The first series I started was the Tales from the Gas Station series by Jack Townsend. I read volume one. I loved this story. It read very much like a creepypasta from the early 2000s. This story takes place in this small town where weird supernatural things are always happening. The main setting is a gas station at the edge of this small town. And we follow Jack, a lonely gas station clerk with a terminal illness, as he lives out his final days working his dead-end job that perhaps he doesn't love, but he is attached to it. There is mutated raccoons. There's the ghost of a cowboy in the bathroom. There's a cult in the woods. There's monsters. And that's all in just the prologue. This is one of those stories that you can never predict. I had no idea it was going to happen from page to page. The ending, I'm still thinking about it. I'm still not exactly sure where the series is going. There are four volumes. But I did love the dialogue. I loved all the funny moments. I've loved Jack as a protagonist. I feel like his terminal illness like, led to a very interesting narrative style. Like, is Jack an unreliable narrator? You have to read it to understand. If you're looking for a creepy, humorous read to read during the spooky season, I think Tales from the Gas Station will scratch that itch. It's random. It's a fever dream. I love the characters. And I can't wait to see where the series goes. The second series I started in September, and hopefully the last series I start in 2024, if I want to keep this series that I'm reading down, is the Nova Terra series by Seth Ring. The first installment is Titan. And how did I like it? I liked it a lot. Four out of five stars for me. Titan takes place in a virtual reality video game world. Our protagonist is an individual who suffers from a debilitating disability in real life. And while he's undergoing medical treatment, he's going to live in this video game world for years and years and years. And he has to build a life for himself. Otherwise, it'd be very boring. There's adventures. There's friendships, alliances, enemies to be made. Our character is overpowered a little bit. Our protagonist is a little bit overpowered. He does kind of seem to find solutions to his problems rather easily. But it kind of reminds me of like watching Dragon Ball Z when I was younger. We have this overpowered, lovable protagonist encountering villains and bad guys and figuring, and figuring out ways to outsmart them. I love the betrayals. I love the power creep. I found the world to be very immersive. I, I have a mixed relationship with lit RPGs because I love critical failures. I have mi I didn't, I'm not sure how I feel about Cradle. And I was unsure about how I'd feel about Nova Terra. But I'm definitely putting this at the front of the, lo of the line. I'm going to finish Nova Terra definitely before the first half of next year is done. Right after I get up to date with critical failures. But yeah, lit RPGs, maybe they're the th types of things I like to read. I guess we'll have to see. But definitely Nova Terra is my cup of tea. The other patrons, satisfied that this weirdo was the expected dining companion of a seemingly normal person, and therefore less likely to be taking out his frustrations on a cruel and uncaring world, continued their conversations. By far, the funniest books I've read all year are volumes 2 and 3 of Robert Bevan's Critical Failures series. The premise is silly. A bunch of man-childs get thrown into the Dungeons and Dragons world, and they're forced to survive and to deal with the repercussions of their murder hobo ways. Perhaps there's not a lot of character development. Perhaps the plot is over the top, crazy nonsense sometimes. Maybe the big bad is too funny. He's hilarious. He's By far, the funniest books I've read all year are volumes 2 and 3 
of Critical Failures by Robert Bevan. I love these two installments. I, I'm going to have a hard time recommending these books to people because they are incredibly irreverent. They don't take themselves seriously. The humor is very crude and rude and not politically correct. Unless you're a big fan of like early 2000s movies, m movies from the early 2010s perhaps, Super Bad, Hangover, Hot Rod, that type of humor, you won't find these books to be very funny. But I find them to be perfect palate cleanser reads. I love our man-child main characters. I love the over-the-top fever dream of a plot. I find the big bad to be incredibly compelling for how unserious and silly these books are. I'm going to be very sad when I'm up to date with this series and I'm waiting every year for the next installment because Robert Bevan, no author makes me laugh like him. And even though people could read these books and they'll think less of me, I don't care. These are hidden gems in my book. I love them. I will not apologize. And the audiobook productions are amazing. Definitely, if this sounds like your cup of tea, I want you to read these books so we could talk about them, but I'm not recommending them because you probably won't like them. In September, I read seven short stories. All of these were Amazon original stories because Amazon will publish Amazon exclusive content that you could read on Kindle Unlimited. And they're from a bunch of authors that are well known and successful. And these authors like basically put these stories together in anthologies and collections. So that way you can kind of try a little bit of all these different authors. And I've read seven of these stories and most of them were good. So we'll just talk about those, but these are very short. All of these are worth your time. If the subject interests you just because I didn't like them does not mean you won't like them. These Alien Skies, this was a very frustrating read for me because I do think I liked it, but I'm not sure if it was very good. I would only rate it 2.5 out of 5 stars because I feel like the emotional plot twist at the center of this story, I saw it coming from a mile away, and I really feel like maybe it wasn't supposed to be so obvious. I also feel like a lot of the things that were just resolved in the last few pages was just way too easy, way too cookie cutter. Everything just fit together perfectly. There was no sense of tension. There was no sense of stakes. But there was a very interesting commentary on discrimination and racism and slavery and the lengths people will go to escape that legacy of slavery and discrimination, to escape one's tragic past, one's horrible backstory. So I really liked that part. But yeah, though I liked it, I don't think it was very good. 2.5 out of 5 stars. It's the only thing I could rate it in good conscience. The next Amazon short I read was What the Dead Know by Nevo. This follows a fake medium as they're trying to like hustle and con these people who are paying our protagonist to like commune with the dead, but she encounters a real spirit. I really feel like this story was not anything special. Only two out of five stars for me. Nothing of note happened. The writing was not up to the usual standard of Nevo. Curiosity in humans needs to be punished. It leads to disaster. The next thing I read in September was another short story, The Hillside. And I really feel like this story had so much potential. It felt like it was just the outline of a story that should have been at least 15, 20, 30 pages longer. I believe this story was less than 30 pages. It, our protagonist and main character is a horse. This horse's job they are basically a shepherd, a babysitter for some of the last humans on Earth. This story takes place in the future. Humanity has destroyed the world. They've destroyed themselves. And they've reverted to like a caveman-like state. All the surviving animals are voting and debating about whether or not to kill off the humans or to give them their freedom. And there's a great debate about whether or not that's a good or bad thing. Because humans are the only animals that will destroy the world if, we, if we're left to our own devices. Possibly. Theoretically. And I really love the debate that this story kind of was centered around. I really feel like the story and the plot was rushed. I really feel like a lot of the emotional highs and lows did not hit me at all because I was not given sufficient time to care about the characters or to care about the stakes of this story. It's a short story, but it should have been a little bit longer, and I think it could have been much better. So for that reason, I'm just going to rate it probably two out of five stars because great concept, not good execution. If you're one of those people who are constantly saying things like humans don't deserve animals or we're so much worse than animals, you might like this story a lot more than I did, but I did not care for it. Consciousness is a horror show. 
You search for glimpses of beauty to justify your existence. Blake Crouch wrote perhaps my favorite series of all time, The Wayward Pines Trilogy. So I was very excited to read his novella or short story. It's about 90 to 100 pages, Summer Frost. This was 4.5 out of 5 stars for me. I loved it. It follows a woman who discovers a sentient AI in a video game that she helped create. She starts to build a relationship with this AI. She becomes obsessed with this AI as this AI grows to become a more intelligent, powerful entity. And this obsession ruins her life. If you're used to reading AI-based stories, you know AI is pretty dangerous. Like, theoretically, it can be a pretty dangerous thing. It's very scary, powerful technology. And this book tackles a lot of those issues, a lot of the problems that come along with AI becoming more powerful. And I love the ending of this story. I love the relationship between our protagonist and the AI. I love seeing it grow throughout the years. And there was some pretty dang good writing. Blake Crouch has, I've read nothing but home runs from him. And this is no different. Four out of five stars, easy. I would rather love a coward than mourn a legend. The Six Deaths of the Saints by Alex E. Harrow is just 30 pages long. It is a short story, but it is definitely the best short story I've read in 2024. Perhaps the best short story I've read, period, ever, in my entire life. It is amazing. I picked this up on a whim. Someone on Book Talk was recommending it, and I got it off of Kindle Unlimited, and I read it in 20 minutes. And it left me flabbergasted. It was incredibly moving, very thought-provoking. It has all the emotions. I went from sadness to anger to happiness and back. Went on this great journey from the slums to godhood and back. All in less than 30 pages. Beautiful writing. I love our protagonist. This story follows a woman who has been blessed by the goddess of war. And she starts conquering lands and cities and kingdoms for this prince. And perhaps he's using her. Perhaps he's got goals that are completely unrealistic. Perhaps she puts herself in danger to help this prince accomplish his goals. I love the plot twist. I really feel like I lived lifetimes with these characters. Five out of five stars, easy. Next, we have The Slow Time Between Stars by John Scalzi. This was a very interesting story, very thought-provoking. We follow a sentient AI as it drifts from our galaxy to another across hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. This AI, like, you know, gets new material to rebuild itself, to better fit itself for every specific circumstance that it encounters. It has a lot of slow time to think. And it really just put into words how crazy the distance is between our galaxy and the next. How special and how lucky we are to be living on Earth on this little speck of dust in this massive universe. And we follow this AI as it tries to find life in other parts of our universe. I love how thought-provoking this story was. I love our AI. I found them to be a very colorful character despite the fact that they are like a machine and completely unrelatable. But I loved the ending. I love the ramifications of this story. I do think this described intergalaxy -gal travel, intergalaxy travel in a way that makes it incredibly terrifying. And after reading this, I'm quite certain humanity will never leave our solar system. And I I'm willing to put money on that. I liked it. Four out of five stars. I wish it was longer. And that's surprising because it was very slow. The next one I read was The Cleaners by Ken Liu. Ken Liu is best known for his Dandelion Dynasty series. And after reading The Cleaners, I'm already in love with Ken Liu's writing style. I know he's considered to be a great master of writing short stories. That's where he first made his name. And after reading The Cleaners, I can see why. I really love the concept of this story. This story follows a cleaner because in this world, in this timeline, in this setting... Memories leave a residue, not just in our minds, but on the objects that we have in our possession. And our story follows a cleaner, and his job is to clean off memories, whether good or bad, from, the, from people who have passed on. So that way, their descendants, their friends, their family aren't burdened by these memories, by these emotions. Because if you're a very sensitive individual in this world, you could touch an object and kind of feel some of the emotions, feel some of the trauma, feel some of the emotional baggage that comes along with that object. It's a very interesting premise. 
I really wish this story was much longer, but I really do feel like the ending hit all the emotional points I needed. I love the art point of view characters. There was three, two individuals, one cleaner. There was like some sisters in there that I really liked their relationship. I really loved their dynamic. And yeah, really interesting concept. I do wish it was longer. 3.5 out of 5 stars. But Ken Liu, you have my attention. The last Amazon original story I read was Clap Back. And this is the reason why I stopped reading them for the rest of September. Because I absolutely hated this story. That's not to say that it was objectively bad. Because art is subjective. But I hated it. And I'm in the minority. I have to state that. This is between 4 and 5 stars on Amazon. Very high reviews on Goodreads on Amazon. People loved this story. It was another book that talked a lot about the legacy of racism, discrimination, slavery, and how people are trying to escape from that and trying to move past from that. And I really feel like the outlook and point of view of our author and our protagonist was an extremely pessimistic point of view on racial issues. And I don't think they were tackled in a very intelligent way. I found the time jumps in the story to be very jarring. I found the ending to be completely not satisfying. No catharsis. No great revel revelatory moment. And I really feel like the argument and the very interesting thought-provoking thing that happens at the end of the story was not thought-provoking. I feel like it completely missed the point. But I'm in the minority. Read this book if it sounds interesting to you. But yeah, read the synopsis and tell me if I'm wrong. But I truly feel in my bones that this was not a good story. One out of five stars for me, and that's just my opinion. The two graphic novels I read were Volume 2 of The Boys. The Boys is still irreverent. It is still inappropriate. It is still triggering. This comic is not for everybody, but I found it to be very humorous, and it's a very interesting take, a very interesting depiction on how I believe superpowered humans would actually act in the real world. I don't think they'd be heroes. I think they would be insidious, selfish, evil, disturbed individuals. The other graphic novel I read was the graphic novel adaptation of The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I did a review of The Road years and years ago, and I had mixed feelings about it. But after reading this suboptimal, non-satisfactory adaptation, I do think the book is better. It made me want to pick up the book again. Because one of the main parts of the road that I found very interesting was this, was this ongoing dialogue about how the man and the boy, our protagonists, carry with them the fire of civilization, the fire of human goodness, and how they're the good guys, even though the world they live in is falling apart and filled with evil and all manner of heinous things. But the graphic novel adaptation does not have any of that dialogue. There's key parts of there's key scenes and dialogue missing that I really feel like made the novel what it was. And I feel like the pictures and artwork very much fit with the tone and theme and the emotions that come to mind when I did read The Road. But I feel like a lot of the meat wasn't there. Style over substance. I didn't like that. Unless you're a big fan of The Road by Cormac McCarthy, I don't think you I don't think you should give the graphic novel a chance. The one work of nonfiction I read was a poetry collection from Basho, who is one of the great old-timey haiku poets. I think he might have even been the originator of haikus. A lot of these poems are very old. I didn't find them particularly thought-provoking or moving. I think unless you are a poetry major who is particularly interested in the history and development of haikus from several hundred years ago, I don't think you'll get much out of this poetry collection. I do think it's very interesting how even poets hundreds of years ago focus on the same everyday little things that we focus on. So that was kind of cool to see. But yeah, none of the poems stuck out to me. And I don't think I will ever read poets, po haikus from this part of history again. But yeah, you know, maybe I'm just not a haiku person. September was a great reading month. Perhaps the best reading month I've had since I started the channel. I read my first Brandon Sanderson book. I started two series. I finished another series. Robert Bevan made me read a lot. I read a lot of really good Amazon original stories. But what is my book of the month? I'm going to have to say Stoner by John Williams. It's a masterpiece. This book lived up to the hype. I love William Stoner. And I understand why this book is so well loved.
And it's a damn shame that John Williams was not recognized as a genius while he was alive because his books are all top notch. September was a great month. October's almost over, but October's also looking to be a great, wonderful month. I can't wait to see how the rest of the reads go for this year. 2024 is my most successful reading year by far. And I think that makes for very good content going forward. Thank you guys for watching this monthly wrap-up that's almost a month late. And I'll talk to you guys next time.